The following is a conversation with Elon Musk, his fourth time on this, the Lex Friedman podcast. <laughs> I thought you were going to finish it. It's one of the greatest themes in all of film history. Yeah, it's great. So I was just thinking about the Roman Empire, as one does. <laughs> There's that whole meme uh, where... <laughs> old guys are thinking yeah. about the Roman Empire at least yeah. once a day. And half the population is confused whether it's true or not. But more seriously, thinking about the wars going on in the world today, and as you know, uh, war and military conquest has been a big part of uh, Roman society and culture, and it, I think, has been a big part of most empires and dynasties throughout human history. So Yeah, they usually uh, came as a result of conquest. I mean, yeah. there's some like the Austro-Hungarian Empire where there was just a lot of uh, sort of clever marriages. Um, but fundamentally, there's an engine of conquest. And yes, they celebrate excellence in warfare. Many of the leaders were excellent generals, Yeah, that kind of thing. So big picture question, Grok approved. I asked if this is a good question to ask. Get tested, Pro Grok approved? Yeah, <laughs> uh, at least on fun mode. Uh, <laughs> uh, to what degree do you think war is part of human nature versus a consequence of uh, how human societies are structured? I ask this as you have somehow controversially been a proponent of peace. I'm, I'm generally a proponent of peace. I mean, ignorance is perhaps, in my view, the real enemy to be countered. That's the real hard part, not, you know, fighting other humans. Um, but all, all creatures fight. I mean, the the, the jungle is a. You, go, you look at the people think of, of this nature as perhaps some sort of peaceful thing, but in fact, it is not. There's some quite funny when a Herzog thing mm -hmm. where he's like in the jungle, like saying that it's like basically just murder and death in every direction. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the the plants and animals in the jungle are constantly trying to kill and eat each other every single day, every minute. So it's not like. Uh, you know, we're unusual in that respect. Well, this, there's a relevant question here, whether with greater intelligence uh, comes greater control over these base instincts for violence. Yes. We have much more of an ability to control our, our um, limbic instinct for violence than, say, a chimpanzee. And in fact, if, you, if one looks at, say, chimpanzee society, it is not friendly. I mean, the bonobos are an exception. Um, but... Chimpanzee society is uh, filled with violence, and it's quite quite horrific, frankly. That that's that's our limbic system in action. Like you don't want to be on the wrong side of a chimpanzee; it'll eat your face off and tear your nuts off. Yeah, basically, there's no limits or ethics. Or uh, the Romans had just war. There's no just war in, the ch in chimpanzee societies. Is is war and, and and dominance by any means necessary? Yeah, chimpanzee society is a pr like a primitive version of human society. Um, it's, it's, they're not like peace loving, basically, um, at all. Um, there, there's extreme violence, um, and then once in a while, some, some, somebody who's watched too many Disney movies decides to raise a chimpanzee as a pet, um, and then that eats their face or rips their nuts off or chews their fingers off, that kind of thing. Yeah, it's happened several times. Uh, ripping your nuts off is an interesting strategy <laughs> for interaction. <laughs> some, it's happened to people. It's un unfortunate. Like that's, I guess, a one way to. Ensure that the other chimp doesn't, uh, you mm -hmm. know, contribute to the gene pool. Well, from a martial arts perspective, it's a fascinating strategy. <laughs> the, 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 the nut ripper. <laughs> I wonder which of the martial arts teaches that. <laughs> I think it's safe to say if somebody's <laughs> got your nuts in their hands <laughs> and has the option of ripping them off, you will be amenable to uh, whatever they want. Yeah. Safe to say. <laughs> So like I said, somehow controversially, you've been a uh, proponent of peace on, on Twitter, on X. Yeah. So let me ask you about the wars going on today and to see what the path to peace could be. How do you hope the current war in Israel and Gaza comes to an end? Uh, what path do you see that can minimize human suffering in the long term in that part of the world? 
Well, I think it, it, that that part of the world is is definitely uh, like if you look up the there is no easy answer in the dictionary. It'll be that like the picture of uh, the Middle East um, and Israel, especially. So there is no easy answer. Um, or what my uh, this is strictly my opinion of uh, you know uh, is that. Uh, the the goal of Hamas was to provoke an overreaction from Israel. Um, they obviously did not expect to, uh, you know, have a military victory, um, but they they, expe- they they really wanted to commit the worst atrocities that they could in order to provoke the the most aggressive response possible from Israel, um, and then leverage that uh, aggressive response to um, rally. Muslims worldwide uh, for the cause of uh, Gaza and Palestine, which they have succeeded in doing. Um, so, the, the 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 counterintuitive thing here, I think that the the thing that I think should be done, even though it is very difficult, uh, is that um, I, I would recommend that Israel engage in the most cons- conspicuous acts of kindness possible. Every po- everything that is the actual thing that would thwart the goal of Hamas. So in some sense, the degree that makes sense in geopolitics, turn the other cheek, implemented. It's not exactly turn the other cheek, um, because I do think that there's, um, you know, that, that I think it, it is appropriate for Israel to find the Hamas members and, you know, um, either either kill them or incarcerate them. Um, like, that something, that something has to be done, because they're, they're just going to keep 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 coming, otherwise. Um, but uh, in addition to that, they need to do whatever they can. Um, there's some talk of uh, establishing, for example, a mobile hospital. I'd recommend doing that. Um, just making sure that uh, you know there's food, water, uh, medical necessities, um, and and just be over the top about it and be. Very transparent, so it's it, so that it can't people can't claim it's a trick. Like just put a webcam on the thing, mm-hmm. uh, you know, all twenty four seven. Deploy acts of kindness. Yeah, conspicuous acts of kindness that that with that are unequivocal, meaning they can't be somehow because Hamas will then their response will be, oh, it's a trick. Mm-hmm. Therefore, you have to counter how how is it not a trick. This ultimately fights the broader force of hatred in the in the region. Yes, and I'm not sure who said it. It's an apocryphal saying, but an eye for the for an eye makes everyone blind. Now, now that neck of the woods, they really believe in the whole eye for an eye thing. Um, but I mean, you really have if if you're not going to just outright uh, Commit genocide like against an entire people, which obviously would not be acceptable to to, to uh, really shouldn't be acceptable to anyone. Um, then you're, you're going to leave basically a lot of people alive who subsequently, you know, hate Israel. So really, the question is like, how for for every Hamas member that you kill, how many did you create? Mm-hmm. And if you create more than you killed, you've not succeeded. That's the you know the real situation there. Um, and it's safe to say that if you know, um, if you know, if if you kill somebody's child in Gaza, if you've you've made at least a few uh, Hamas members who will die just just to kill an Israeli. That's the situation. So, <clears throat> but but I mean, this is one of the most contentious subjects. One could possibly discuss, but but I, I think if if the if the goal ultimately is some sort of long term peace, one has to be look at this from the standpoint of over time, are there more or fewer uh, terrorists being created? Let me just uh, linger on war. Yeah, well, war. It's safe to say wars always existed and always will exist. Always will exist. Always has always has existed and always will exist. I hope not. You and think always, it always will? Always, there will always be war. This question of just how much war and and um, you know what you know there's this there's this the sort of the scope and scale of war, mm-hmm. but to, ma- I, to imagine that there would not be any war in the future, I think would be 
a very unlikely outcome. Yeah, you talked about the culture series. There's war even there. Yes, there's a giant war. The first book starts off with um, a gigantic galactic war where trillions die, trillions. But it still nevertheless protects these pockets of, of flourishing. Some, somehow you can have galactic war and still have pockets of flourishing. Yeah, I mean, it's. I guess if we are able to one day expand to, you know, fill the galaxy or whatever, there will be a, a galactic war at some point. Ah, uh, the scale. I mean, the scale of war has been increasing, increasing, increasing. It's like a race between the scale of suffering and the scale of flourishing. Yes. A lot of people seem to be using this tragedy to beat the drums of war and feed the military industrial complex. Do you worry about this? The people who are rooting for escalation and how can it be stopped? One of the things that does concern me is that there are very few people alive today who actually uh, viscerally understand the horrors of war, at least in the US. I mean, obviously there are people in, on the front lines in Ukraine and Russia who understand just how terrible war is, um, but how many people in, in the West understand it? Um, you know, my grandfather was in World War II. Uh, he was severely traumatized. I um, mean, he was there, for, I think, in the, for almost six years in the you know, in uh, East and North Africa and Italy. Uh, all his friends were killed uh, in front of him, and uh, he would have died too, um, except they randomly gave some, I guess, IQ test or something, and uh, he scored very high. Um, now he was not an officer; he was, a, I think, a corporal or a sergeant or something like that, um, because he didn't finish high school. Um, he had to drop out of high school because his, his his dad died, and he had to work to support his uh, siblings. Um, so, because he didn't graduate high school, he was not eligible for the officer corps. Um, so, you know, he kind of got put into the cannon fodder category, mm -hmm. <laughs> basically. Um, but then, this, randomly, they gave him this test. He was transferred to British intelligence in London. That's where he met my grandmother. Um, but uh, he, he had PTSD next level, like next level. I mean, just didn't talk, just didn't talk. And if you tried talking to him, he'd just tell you to shut up. And he won a bunch of medals, never never bragged about it once, not, not even hinted, nothing. I like found out about it because I, his military records were online. That's, uh, that's how, well, how I know. So he would say like, no, no way in hell. Do you want to, do you want to do that again? But how many people, um, now he, he obviously, he, now he died, you know, 20 years ago or longer, actually 30 years ago. Um, how many people are alive that remember World War II? Not many. And the same perhaps applies to the threat of nuclear war. <sighs> yeah. I mean, there are enough nuclear bombs pointed at, uh, the United States to, make the rubble, the radioactive rubble bounce many times. There's two major wars going on right now. So you talked about the threat of AGI quite a bit, but now as we sit here with the intensity of conflict going on, do you worry about nuclear war? I think we shouldn't discount the possibility of nuclear war. Um, it is a civilizational threat. Um, Right now, I could be wrong, but I think the, the, the current probability of nuclear war is quite low. Um, but there are a lot of nukes pointed at us. So, and we have a lot of nukes pointed at other people. They're still there. Nobody's put their uh, their guns away. The, the missiles are still in the silos. And uh, the leaders don't seem to be the ones with the nukes talking to each other. No. There are wars which are tragic and difficult on a, on a local basis. And then there are wars which are civilization ending or have that potential. Obviously global thermonuclear warfare has high potential to end civilization, perhaps, perhaps permanently, but certainly you know, to severely uh, wound and, and perhaps uh, set back uh, human progress by, you know, to the stone age or something. I don't know, pretty bad. Um, probably scientists and engineers want to be super popular after that as well. <laughs> They're like, you got us into this mess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So generally, we, I think we, we obviously want to prioritize civilizational risks over things that are um, 
painful and tragic on, on a local level, but not civilizational. How do you hope the war in Ukraine comes to an end? And what's the path, once again, to minimizing human suffering there? Uh, well, I think that what what is likely to happen, uh, which is really pretty much the, the way it is, is that um, something very close to the current lines uh, will be how a ceasefire or truce happens. But, you know, you, you just have a situation right now where whoever goes on the offensive um, will suffer casualties at several times the rate of whoever's on the defense. Because mm-hmm. um, you've got uh, defense in depth, you've got minefields, uh, trenches, anti-tank defenses. Um, nobody has air superiority because um, the, the, the anti-aircraft missiles are really far better than the, the aircraft. Like there are far more of them. Um, and uh, so neither side has uh, air superiority. Um, tanks are basically death traps, um, just slow moving, and they're, they're not immune to anti-tank weapons. Mm-hmm. So you you really just have long range artillery um, and uh, infantry trenches. It's World War One, all over again mm-hmm. with drones. You know, throwing old drones, some some drones there, um, which makes the long range artillery just that much more accurate. And yeah. better, and so more efficient at murdering people on both sides. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's whoever is you don't you don't you don't want to be trying to advance uh, from either side because the probability of dying is incredibly high. Um, so in order to overcome uh, defense in depth trenches and minefields, you really need a significant local superiority in numbers. Um, Ideally, combined arms, where where you you do a fast attack with aircraft, a, a concentrated number of tanks, um, and a lot of people. That's the only way you're going to punch through a line. And then you're going to punch through and st- and and then not have reinforcements just kick you right out again. I mean, if, if you, I, I really recommend people read uh, World War One warfare in detail. It's rough. Um, I mean, the sheer number of people that died there was mind boggling. And it's almost impossible to um, imagine the end of it that doesn't look like almost exactly like the beginning in terms of what land belongs to who and so on. But on the other side of a lot of human suffering, death and destruction of infrastructure. Yes, I mean, the thing that, the reason I've, I, you know, proposed a, a some sort of truce or, or, or peace a year ago was because I predicted pretty much exactly what would, would happen, uh, which is a lot of people dying for basically almost no changes in land, um, and this, the 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 loss of the the flower of Ukrainian and Russian youth, and we should have some sympathy for the. The Russian boys as well as the Ukrainian boys, because the Russian boys didn't, didn't ask to be on their front line. They have to be. So um, there's a lot of sons not, not coming back to their parents, you know. And and I think most of them don't don't really have. They don't hate the other side, you know. It's sort of like as this saying about like this, this saying comes from World War One. It's like young boys who don't know each other killing each other on behalf of old men that do know each other. The hell's the point of that? So Volodymyr Zelensky said that he's not, or has said in the past, he's not interested in talking to Putin directly. Do you think he should yeah. sit down, man to man, leader to leader, and negotiate peace? Look, I think I would just recommend do not send the flower of Ukrainian youth to, be, to die uh, in trenches. Uh, whether he talks to Putin or not, just don't do that. Um, whoever goes on the offensive will lose massive numbers of people. Um, and history will not look kindly upon them. You've spoken honestly about the possibility of war between U.S. and China in the long term, if no diplomatic solution is found. For example, on the question of Taiwan and one China policy. Right. 
How do we avoid the trajectory where these two superpowers clash? Well, it's it's worth reading that book on the, the uh, difficult to pronounce Thucydides trap, I believe it's called. I love war history. I like inside out and backwards. Um, there's hardly a battle I haven't read read about. And and trying to figure out like what what really was the cause of victory in any particular case, as opposed to what one side or another claimed was the, the reason. Both the victory and what sparked the war, and yeah, yeah, the whole thing. Yeah. So that Athens and Sparta is a classic case. The thing about the Greeks is they really wrote down a lot of stuff. They loved writing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are lots of interesting things that happened in many parts of the world, but they just, people just didn't write it down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we don't know what happened, or they didn't really write with in detail. They just mm -hmm. would say like, "We went, we had a battle, and we won." And like, well, what? Can you add a bit more? Um, <laughs> the, the, the Greeks, they really wrote a lot. <laughs> They were very articulate on, they just love writing. So, mm -hmm. and we have a bunch of that writing that's preserved. So we know what led up to the uh, Peloponnesian War between um, the Spartan and Athenian alliance. Um, and uh, we, we know that they, they, for quite, they, they saw it coming. I mean, the Spartans didn't write, they, they also weren't very verbose by their nature, but they did write, but they weren't very verbose. <laughs> yeah, they were terse. Uh, but the, the, Athenians and the other Greeks wrote, wrote a line. And they were like, um, and Sp Sparta was really kind of like the leader of, of Greece. Um, but, but Athens grew stronger and stronger with each passing year. And, um, and everyone's like, well, that's inevitable that there's gonna be a clash between Athens and Sparta. Uh, well, how do we avoid that? And they couldn't, they couldn't, they actually, they saw it coming and they still could not avoid it. <laughs> so, you know, at some point, if there's, if, if one uh, group, one civilization or, or country or whatever um, exceeds another, sort of like if, you know, the United States has been the biggest kid on the block for, since I think around 1890 for, from an economic standpoint. So the United States has been the economic, most powerful economic engine in the world longer than anyone's been alive. Um, and the foundation of war is economics. So now we have a situation in the case of China where the, um, the economy is likely to be two, perhaps three times larger than that of the US. So imagine you're the biggest kid on the block for as long as anyone can remember, and suddenly a kid comes along who's twice your size. So we see it coming. Yeah. How is it possible to stop? Is there some, let me throw something out there, just intermixing of cultures, understanding. There does seem to be a giant cultural gap in understanding of each other. And you're an interesting case study because you are an American, obviously mm -hmm. you've done a lot yes. of uh, incredible manufacture here in the United States, but you also work with China. I've spent a lot of time in China and met with the leadership many times. Maybe a good question to ask is, what are some things about China that people don't understand, positive, just in the culture? What's some interesting things that you've learned about the Chinese? Well, uh, the, the sheer number of really smart, hardworking people in China is um, incredible. Uh, there are, I believe, if you say like, how many smart, hardworking people are there in China? There's far more of them there than there are here, I think, in my, in my opinion. Um, the, uh, and they've got a lot of energy. So, I mean, the, the architecture in China that's in recent years is far more impressive than the US. I mean, in the, the, the train stations, the buildings, the high speed rail, everything, it's um, really far more impressive than what we have in the US. I, I mean, I recommend somebody just go to Shanghai and Beijing, look at the buildings and go to, you know, take the train from Beijing to Xi'an, where you have the Terracotta Warriors. Um, China's got an incredible history, a uh, very long history. And, um, you know, I think arguably the, in terms of the use of language from, from a written standpoint, um, sort of one of one of the oldest, perhaps, perhaps the oldest written language. And, and then China, people did write things down. So, 
Um, now China um, historically has always been, with rare exception, been internally focused. Um, they have not been acquisitive. Uh, they've they've fought each other. There have been many, many civil wars. Mm -hmm. um, in the Three Kingdoms War, I believe they lost about seventy percent of their population. So and, and that does. So the they've had brutal internal wars, like civil wars that make the U.S. civil war look t small by comparison. Um, so it, I think it's important to appreciate that China is not uh, monolithic. Mm -hmm. um, we sort of think of like China as a sort of one entity of one mind, and this is definitely not the case. Um, from what I've seen, and I think most people who understand China would agree, that people in China think about China 10 times more than they think about anything outside of China. So it's like 90% of their consideration is, uh, you know, are, is, is, is internal. Well, isn't that a really positive thing? When you're talking about the collaboration and a future peace between superpowers, when you're inward facing, which is like focusing on improving yourself versus focusing on, yeah, uh, quote unquote, improving others through military might. The good news, the history of China suggests that China is not acquisitive, meaning they're not gonna go out and invade a whole bunch of countries. Mm -hmm. um, now they do feel very strongly, you know, so that's that's good. I mean, because a, a lot of very powerful countries have been acquisitive. Mm -hmm. um, the, the US is one of the, also one of the rare cases that has not been acquisitive. Like in, after World War II, the US could have basically taken over the world and any country, like we got nukes, nobody else got nukes. We don't even have to lose soldiers. Uh, which country do you want? Mm -hmm. And the United States could have taken over everything. Oh, it, at will, and it didn't. Um, and the United States actually helped rebuild countries. So it helped rebuild Europe, you know, it helped rebuild Japan. Um, this is very unusual behavior, almost unprecedented. Um, you know, the US did conspicuous acts of kindness, like the Berlin airlift. You know, um, and and I think uh, you know there's, it's always like, well, America's done bad things. Well, of course, America's done bad things, but one needs to look at the uh, the whole track record, um, and and just generally, you know, one one sort of test would be how do you treat your prisoners of war, mm -hmm. or let's say, um, you know, no offense to the Russians, but. Let's say you're in Germany, it's 1945. You got the Russian army coming on one side, and you got the French, British, and American armies coming on the other side. Who would you like to be to surrender to? Like no country is like morally perfect, but I recommend uh, being a POW with the Americans. That would be my choice very strongly. <laughs> in the full menu of POW. Very US. much so. <laughs> and in fact, one of our brown, um, yeah. Took you know a small guy uh, was like we've got to be captured by the Americans. Yeah, and uh, in, in fact the SS was under orders to execute von Braun and, and all of the uh, German rocket engineers, uh, and they narrowly escaped their SS. They, they said they were going out for a walk in the woods. They left in the middle of winter with no coats, uh, and <laughs> then ran like and with no food, no coats, no water. And just ran like hell uh, and ran west. Um, and by sheer like they, I think his brother found like a, a bicycle or something, and um, and then just cycled west as fast as he could and found found a U.S. patrol. Um, so anyway, that's that's one that's one way you can tell morality is who, 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 where do you want to be a POW? <laughs> it's, it's not fun anywhere, but some places are much worse than others. So. Um, anyway, so, so, so I think America has been, uh, while far from perfect, uh, generally a, a benevolent force. Um, and uh, we should always be self-critical and uh, we try to be better. Um, but um, anyone with half a brain knows that. So, so I think there are, in this way, China and uh, the United States are similar. Ne neither country has been acquisitive. Um, in, in a significant way. So that's like a, you know, a, a shared principle, I guess. Um, now, now China does feel very strongly about Taiwan. They've 
been very clear about that for a long time. Um, you know, from this standpoint, it's it's it would be like one of the states is is, is you know not, not there like like Hawaii or something like that, but but more significant than Hawaii, you know. Um, and Hawaii is pretty significant for us, so um, they, they they view it as 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 really the that there's a fundamental part of China, uh, the island of Formosa, now now Taiwan that is. Um, not part of China, but should be. Uh, and the only reason it, it hasn't been is because of the US Pacific fleet. And as their economic power grows and as their military power grows, the thing that they're clearly saying uh, is their interest will, you know, clearly be materialized. Yes. China has been very clear that um, they will incorporate Taiwan uh, peacefully or uh, militarily, but that they will incorporate it from their standpoint is 100% likely. You know, something you said about conspicuous acts of kindness, as a geopolitical policy, it almost seems naive, but I'd venture to say that this is probably the path forward, how you avoid most wars. Just as you say mm -hmm. it, it sounds naive, but it's kind of brilliant. If you believe in the goodness of underlying most of human nature, it just seems like conspicuous acts of kindness can uh, reverberate through the populace of the countries involved. And, yeah, well, and deescalate. Absolutely. So, for, in, in, after World War One, the the they made a big mistake. You know, they, they basically tried to lump all the blame on Germany. Um, and um and and it, you know settled Germany with uh impossible reparations um and you know really there was a lot of there was a fair quite a bit of blame to um go around for world war 1 um but they they try to you know put it all on germany um and uh that was that that laid the seeds for world war 2 uh, so, it's a lot of people. Well, not just Hitler. A lot of people felt wronged, um, and they wanted vengeance, and they got it. People don't forget. Yeah, you you you, know, you kill somebody's father, or mother, or son, daughter. They're not going to forget it. They will want vengeance. Um, so after World War II, they're like, well, the Treaty of Versailles. Was a huge mistake um, in World War One, and um, so this time, instead of uh, you know crushing the losers, we're we're actually going to help them with the Marshall Plan, and we're going to help rebuild re rebuild uh, Germany. Um, we're going to help rebuild, uh, or you know Austria and the the other you know Italy and whatnot. So. Um, and that was the right move. There is a, it does feel like there's a profound truth to uh, conspicuous acts of kindness being an antidote to this. Something must stop the, the cycle of reciprocal violence. Something must stop it. Or it will, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll never stop. Just eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, limb for a limb, life for a life. Forever and ever. To escape briefly the darkness with some incredible engineering work. Uh, XAI just released Grok AI Assistant mm -hmm. that I've gotten a chance to play with. It's uh, it's amazing on many levels. First of all, it's amazing that a relatively small team in a relatively short amount of time was able to develop this close to state of the art system. Uh, another. Uh, incredible things. There's a regular mode and there's a fun mode. Yeah, I guess I'm to blame for that one. <laughs> <laughs> I wish, it, first of all, I wish everything in life had a fun mode. Yeah. I, there's something compelling beyond just fun about the fun mode yeah. interacting with a large language model. I'm not sure exactly what it is because I only have had a little bit of time to play with it, but it just makes it more interesting, more vibrant to interact with the system. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. I, um, 
Our, our, <laughs> our AI Grok is modeled after the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, one of my favorite books. Uh, which is it's a book on philosophy disguised as a book on humor, mm -hmm. um, and um, I would say that is that forms the basis of my philosophy, uh, which is that we don't know the meaning of life. But the more we can expand the scope and scale of consciousness, digital and biological, the more we're able to understand what questions to ask about the answer that is the universe. So I have a philosophy of curiosity. There is generally a feeling like this AI system has an outward looking, like the way you are like sitting with a good friend, looking up at the stars, like the, the asking podhead like questions about the universe, wondering what it's all about, the curiosity you talk about. There, there's a sense, no matter how mundane the question I ask it, there's, there's a sense of cosmic grandeur to the whole thing. Well, we, we are actually working hard to have uh, engineering, math, and physics answers that you can count on. Mm -hmm. um, so for the other sort of AIs out there that, what is these so-called large language models. Um, I've not found the uh, engineering to be reliable. Um, and it, it, the hallucination, it, it unfortunately hallucinates mo most when you least want it to hallucinate. Yeah. <laughs> so when you ask important, diff difficult questions, it, that's when it tends to be confidently wrong. Um, so we're really tr trying hard to say, okay, how do we be as grounded as possible so you can count on the results? Um, trace things back to physics first principles, uh, mathematical logic. Um, so underlying the humor is an aspiration to ad adhere to the truth of the universe as closely as possible. That's really tricky. It is tricky. So that's why, you know, you, you, there's always gonna be some amount of error, but we wanna um, aspire to be as, truthful as possible about the answers uh, with acknowledged error. Um, so that there was always, you don't wanna be confidently wrong. So you're not, not gonna be right every time, but you don't want to be, you wanna minimize how often you're confidently uh, wrong. And then like I said, once you can count on the logic as being um, not violating physics, then you can start to, to build on that to create uh, inventions, like invent new technologies. But if if you can't if if you if you cannot count on the foundational physics being correct, obviously the inventions are simply wishful thinking, you know, imagination land, magic, basically. Well, as you said, I think one of the big goals of XAI is to understand the universe. Yes, that's our simple three-word uh, mission. <laughs> um, if you look out far into the future, do you think? on this level of physics, the very edge of what we understand about physics, do you think it will make discoveries, sort of the sexiest discovery of them as, as we know now, sort of uh, unifying general relativity and quantum mechanics? So coming up with a theory of everything, do you think it could push towards that direction, almost like theoretical physics discoveries? If an AI cannot figure out new physics, um, it's clearly not equal to humans. Let alone, nor, nor has surpassed humans, because humans have figured out new physics. They've just, you know, physics is just understanding, you know, deepening one's insight into how reality works, and then, um, then, then, then this engineering, which is inventing things that have never existed. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the the range of possibilities for engineering is far greater than for physics, because you know, once you figure out the rules of the universe, uh, that that's that's it. You've discovered things that already existed. Um, but from that, you can then build technologies with, that are really almost limitless in the uh, variety and cap you know, it's like once you understand the rules of the game properly, and we do, we, you know, with current physics, we do, at least at a local level, understand how physics works very well. Where our ability to predict things is incredibly good. Like quantum mechanics is, the degree to which quantum mechanics can predict outcomes is incredible. Um, that was my that was my hard, hardest class in college, by the way. <laughs> my, my my senior quantum mechanics class was harder than all of my other classes put together. To get an AI system 
a large language model to to um, reliably be as reliable as quantum mechanics and physics is very difficult. Yeah, you have to test any, any conclusions against the ground truth of reality. Reality is the ultimate judge. Like physics is the law, everything else is a recommendation. <laughs> I've seen plenty of people break the break the laws made by man, but none break the laws made by physics. Yeah, it's a good test, actually. If this LLM uh, understands and matches physics, then you can more reliably trust whatever it thinks about the current state of yeah. politics <laughs> in some it, sense. It, and it's, it's also not, not the case currently that uh, even that its internal logic is not consistent. Mm. Um, so it's especially um, with these, with the approach of like just predicting a token, predict token, predict token, it's like a vector sum. You know, you, you're summing up a bunch of vectors, but you, you can get drift. Um, so as those, a little bit of error, a little bit of error adds up. Mm -hmm. And by the time you are many tokens down the path, uh, you're, it, it doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. So it has to be somehow self-aware about the drift. <laughs> it has to be self-aware about the drift and then look at the thing as a gestalt, as a whole, mm -hmm. and, and say, it does it have coherence as a whole? Mm -hmm. So, you know, when, when authors write books, that they, they will write the book and then they'll go and revise it. You know, to take into account, you know, all the, the end and the beginning and the middle and, and uh, rewrite it to achieve coherence so that it doesn't end, end up in a nonsensical place. Mm -hmm. Maybe the process of revising is what yeah. reasoning is. And then that's the process of revising is how you get closer and closer to truth. Maybe you like, uh, I, at least I approach it that way. You just say a bunch of bullshit first and then you get it better. You start a bullshit yeah. and then you get you create a closer. draft and then and then you and then you iterate on that draft <laughs> yeah. um, until it has, has coherence until it's, it's it all adds up basically. So another question about theory of everything, but for intelligence, do you think there exists as you're exploring this with XAI creating this intelligence system? Do you think there is a theory of intelligence where you get to understand what like? what is the I in AGI and what is the I in um, human intelligence? There's no I in Team America. Oh, wait, there is. <laughs> uh, now it's going to be stuck in my head now. <laughs> uh, yeah. There's, there's no me and whatever. Uh, in quantum mechanics. Oh, wait. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I mean, is that part of the process of discovering, understanding the universe is understanding intelligence? Yeah. Yeah, I think we need to understand intelligence, understand consciousness. I, I mean, I, there, there, I mean, there are some sort of fundamental questions of like, what is thought? What is emotion? Yeah. Um, is it really just one atom bumping into another atom? It feels like something more than that. Uh, so I, I, I. I I think we're probably missing some really big things, um, like s some really big things. Something that'll be obvious in retrospect. Yes. Like there's a giant, like you, you put the whole consciousness, emotion. Well, some people would call it like a, like a soul, you know, religion yeah, soul. would be a soul. Um, like you feel like you're you, right? I mean, you don't feel like mm -hmm. you're just a co collection of atoms, but on what dimension, does thought exist? What dimension does do emotions exist? We feel them very strongly. Um, I suspect there's more to it than atoms bumping into atoms. And maybe AI can pave the path to the discovery of what whatever the hell that thing is. Yeah. What is consciousness like? What if, when you put the atoms in a particular shape? Why are they able to form thoughts mm -hmm. and take actions that, that and, and feelings? And even if it is an illusion, why is this illusion so compelling? Yeah. Like how do, Why how, does this illusion exist? It, yeah. On, on what plane does this, it, 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 this illusion exist? Yeah. Um, and that sometimes I wonder is, you know, either perhaps everything's conscious or nothing is conscious. Um, one of the two. I like the former. Everything conscious just seems more fun. It does seem more, th more fun, yes. Um, but we're, we're composed of atoms, and those atoms are co composed of quarks and leptons. And those quarks and leptons have been around since the beginning of the universe. 
the beginning of the universe. Right, what, what seems to be the beginning of the universe. The first time we talked, you said what you would, which is surreal that, to think that this discussion was happening is becoming a reality. I asked you what question would you ask an AGI system once you create it? And you said, what's outside the simulation is the question. And, <laughs> good question. Yeah. But it seems like with Grok, you started to, this, literally, uh, the system's goal is to be able to ask such questions, to answer such questions and yeah. to ask such questions. Where are the aliens? Or the aliens? That's one of the, the like the Fermi paradox question. Um, a lot of people have asked me if, if, if I've seen any evidence of aliens, and I've, I haven't, which is kind of concerning because then I think would I'd probably prefer to at least to have seen some archaeological evidence of aliens. Um, to, to the best of my knowledge, there is no proof. I, I'm not aware of any evidence of aliens. If they're out there, they're very subtle. We might just be the only consciousness, at least in the galaxy. Um, and if you, if you look at, say, the history of Earth, for one is to believe the archaeological record, Earth is about four and a half billion years old. Civilization, as measured from the first writing, is only about 5,000 years old. We have to give some credit there to the ancient Sumerians, who aren't around anymore. I think it was the archaic pre-cuneiform was the first actual symbolic representation but only about 5,000 years ago. I think that's a good date for, for when we say civilization started. That's one millionth of Earth's existence. So civilization has been around, it's really a flash in the pan mm -hmm. so far. Um, and why, why have we, why did it take so long for, you know, four and a half billion years. Um, for the vast majority of the time, there was no life, and, and then there was archaic bacteria for a very long time. And then, you know, you had mitochondria get captured, multicellular life, um, differentiation into plants and animals, life moving from the oceans to land, mammals, um, higher brain functions. And the sun is expanding slowly, um, but it, it, it will, it will overheat, it will, it will heat, heat the earth up at a, some point in the future, um, boil the oceans and, and earth will become like Venus where, where no life, life as we know it is impossible. So if we do not become multiplanetary and ultimately go beyond our solar system, um, annihilation of all life on Earth is a certainty. A certainty. Um, and it could be as little as, <laughs> on the galactic time scale, uh, half a billion years. You know, it's a long time by human standards, but th that's only 10% longer than Earth has been around at all. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if life had taken 10% longer to evolve on Earth, it wouldn't exist at all. We've got a deadline coming up. <laughs> yeah. Better hurry. But that said, as you said, humans, intelligent life on Earth developed a lot of cool stuff very quickly. So yes. it, it seems like becoming multiplanetary is almost inevitable. Unless we destroy We need thing. to do it. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's not... I mean, I, I suspect that they're... they're if we are able to go out there and explore other star systems that we, there's a good chance we find a, a whole bunch of long dead one planet civilizations. Yeah. They never p made it past their home planet. That's so sad. It's yeah. sad. Also fascinating. I mean, there are various explanations for the Fermi paradox. And one is just the sort of, there are these great filters, which civilizations don't pass through. And one of those great filters is, do you become a multi-planet civilization or not? And if you don't, it's simply a matter of time before something happens on your planet, um, you know, either natural or man-made, that causes us to die out, like the dinosaurs. Where are they now? They didn't have spaceships. <laughs> so, I think the more likely thing is because just a, a 
empathize with the aliens, that they, they found us and they're protecting us and letting us be. I hope so, we're nice aliens. Just like the tribes in the, in the Amazon, the uncontacted tribes were protecting them. That's what- uh, That would be a nice explanation. Or you could have like, uh, what was it? Uh, I think Andre Kapathi said, it's like the ants in the Amazon asking, where's everybody? <laughs> well, they do run into a lot of other ants. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> they have these ant wars. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a good TV show. Yeah, they literally have these big wars between various ants. Yeah, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm just uh, <laughs> uh, dismissing all the different diversity of ants. You should listen to that Werner Herzog talking about the jungle. It's really <laughs> hilarious. Have you heard it? No, I have not. It's awesome. But Werner Herzog is a way. <laughs> <laughs> you should play. You should play it for, for the you know as an interlude in the. Yeah. <laughs> it's on YouTube. It's it's awesome. <laughs> I love him so much. Yeah, uh, he's great. Was he the director of Happy People, Life in the Taiga? I think also. He did that the, bear documentary. The bear documentary. And did this yeah. thing about penguins. Yeah. <laughs> the <laughs> the, the, the analysis, the psychoanalysis <laughs> of a penguin. <laughs> yeah, the penguins like headed for like the mountains like that are like 70 miles away. <laughs> yeah. And penguin is just headed for doom, basically. Well, he was had a cynical take. I, I have a, he could be just the brave explorer and, and there'll be great stories told. Yeah about him amongst the penguin population for many centuries to come. Um, <laughs> what are we talking about? Okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so aliens, I mean, I, I don't know. Look, I think it, the smart move uh, is just, you know, this is the first time in the history of Earth that it's been possible for life to ex ex extend beyond Earth. Um, that window is open. Um, now it may be open for a long time or it may be open for a short time. And it, it may be open now and then never open again. So I, th I think the smart move here is to make life multiplanetary while it is possible to do so. We don't want to be one of those lame one planet civilizations no. that just dies out. No, those are lame. Yeah, lame. <laughs> um, <laughs> self-respecting civilization would be one planet. There's not gonna be a Wikipedia entry for one of those. And uh, pause. Uh, does SpaceX have an official uh, policy for when we meet aliens? No. <laughs> okay. That seems irresponsible. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, if, 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 if I see the slightest indication that there are aliens, I will immediately post on the X platform yeah. anything I know. It could be the most liked, reposted post of all time. Yeah, I mean, look, we we have more satellites up there right now than everyone else combined. So, you know, we'd know we know if we've got to maneuver around something, and we're not I don't have to maneuver around anything. If we go to the big questions once again, you said you've uh, you're with Einstein that you believe in the God of Spinoza. <laughs> yes. Uh, so you know that that's a view that God is like the universe and is reveals himself through the laws of physics, or as Einstein said, through the lawful harmony of the world. Yeah, I would agree that, <laughs> that God of the, the simulator or whatever, the, the supreme being or beings, um, uh, re re reveal themselves through the physics. You know, they're creators of this existence. And it's incumbent upon us to try to understand more about this wondrous creation. Who created this thing? Who's running this thing? Like embodying it into a, a singular question with a sexy word on top of it is like focusing the mind to understand. It, it does seem like there's a, um, again, it could be an illusion. It's, it seems like there's a purpose, that there's an underlying master plan of some kind. And it seems like. There may not be a master plan in the sense. That, so there's like maybe an interesting answer to the question of determinism versus free will is that if we are in a simulation, the reason that the, the, these higher beings would hold a simulation is to see what happens. Mm -hmm. So it's not, um, they don't know what happens. Uh, otherwise they wouldn't hold the simulation. Mm -hmm. So when, when humans create a simulation, so it's SpaceX and Tesla, we create simulations all the time. Um, especially for the rocket, you, you, uh, you, know, you have to run a lot of simulations to understand what's gonna happen because you can't really test the rocket until it goes to space and you want it to work. So you have to, you have to simulate 
subsonic, transonic, hyper, uh, supersonic, hypersonic um, ascent, and then coming back, super high heating and um, orbital dynamics. All this is going to be simulated. So, because uh, you don't get very many kicks at the can. But we, we run the simulations to see what happens. Not if we knew what happens, we wouldn't run the simulation. Mm -hmm. So if, if there's, so whoever created this existence, um, is they're running it because they don't know what's going to happen, not because they do. So maybe uh, we both played Diablo. Maybe Diablo was created to see if a druid, your character, could defeat Uber Lilith at the end. They didn't know. Well, the funny thing is that Uber Lilith's uh, her title is Hatred Incarnate. Yeah. Um, and right now, I guess <laughs> you, can, you can ask the Diablo team, but it's almost impossible to defeat hatred uh, in the eternal realm. Yeah, you've streamed yourself dominating tier one hundred nightmare yeah, dungeons. I can and still I, I I can cruise through tier one hundred nightmare dungeons like a stroll in the park, mm -hmm. <laughs> and still you're defeated by hatred. Yeah, I can. There's the, the sort of I guess maybe the second hardest boss is Duriel. Duriel can't even scratch the paint. Mm -hmm. So uh, I killed Duriel, Duriel so many times. Um, and every other boss in the game, all, all of them, kill him so many times, it's easy. Um, but uh, Uber Lilith, otherwise known as Hatred Incarnate, especially if you're a druid and you have no ability to go in, to be invulnerable, you, the, you, there are these <laughs> random death waves that, that come at you. Um, and I'm pretty, you know, really I am 52, so my reflex is not what they used to be, but I'm, I have a lifetime of playing video games. Um, at one point I was, you know, maybe one of the best Quake players in the world. Um, I actually won money for in, in, in what I think was the first paid esports tournament in the US. Um, we were doing, doing four person Quake tournaments and um, we came second. I was the second best person on the team. And the, the, the actual best person, that we were, we're actually winning, we were going to come first, except the best person on the team, his computer crashed halfway through the game. Um, so we, we came second. <laughs> but I got money for it and everything. So like basically I got skills, mm -hmm. you know, albeit, you know, no, no spring spring chicken these days. And um, the to be totally frank, it's driving me crazy, <laughs> trying to beat Lilith as a druid, basically try to, trying, to beat, <laughs> trying to beat Hatred Incarnate in the Eternal Realm. <laughs> As a druid, as a druid, and if you, <laughs> if you, if you, this is really <laughs> vexing. Let me tell you. Um, I mean, the challenge is part of the fun. I, I have seen directly, like you're actually like a world class, incredible video game player. Yeah, and, and I think Diablo. So you're just picking up a new game, mm -hmm. and you're figuring out its fundamentals. You're also with the Paragon board and, and the build, are not somebody like me, who perfectly follows whatever they suggest on the internet, you're also an innovator there. Yeah. <laughs> Which is hilarious to watch. It's like a it's like a mad scientist just trying to figure out the Paragon board and, and, and the build and the, yeah. you know. Um, is there some interesting insights there about um, if, if somebody's starting as a druid, do you have advice? Um, <laughs> I would not recommend playing a druid in the Eternal no. Realm. Um, right now, I think the, most powerful character in this in the seasonal realm is the sorcerer with the lightning balls. Mm -hmm. so the the sorks have huge balls in the, the seasonal. Well, yeah, <laughs> that's what they say. <laughs> so, 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 sorks have huge balls. Um, they do uh, huge balls of lightning. Um, I, I'll take your word for it. And it's actually in, in the seasonal realm that you can you can it's it's like pretty easy to beat uh, Uber Lilith. With the, the, because you get these vampiric powers that amplify your damage and increase your defense and whatnot. So, um, but it's really quite easy to, to defeat uh, hatred seasonally, mm -hmm. but to defeat hatred eternally, it's very difficult. Um, almost impossible. It's virtually <laughs> impossible. It, it seems like this, I don't know, a metaphor for life. You know, yeah. I like the idea that Elon Musk, because I saw I was playing Diablo yesterday and I saw one hundred. Level 100 druid just run by, I will never die. <laughs> and then run back the other way. <laughs> yeah. And it was, there's just some, this metaphor is kind of hilarious that you, Elon Musk, is fighting hatred. 
restlessly fighting hatred in this demonic realm. Yes. It's, it's hilarious. I mean, it's pretty hilarious. No, it's absurd. Uh, <laughs> really, it's exercise and absurdity, and it makes me want to pull my hair out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, what do you get from video games in general? Is there, is there for you, for you personally? I mean, it's, it's I don't know if I, it's, uh, it calms my mind. I mean, you sort of, Killing the, the demons in a video game calms the demons in my mind. Yeah. I, it, if, if you play a tough video game, you can get into like a state of flow, which is very enjoyable. Um, and uh, it, but the, the, admittedly, it, it needs to be not too easy, not too hard. Um, kind of in the Goldilocks zone. Um, and I guess you generally want to feel like you're progressing in the game. So... Um, a good video, and, and there's also beautiful art, um, engaging storylines, um, and it's a, it's, it's like an amazing puzzle to solve, I think, and so it, it's like solving the puzzle. Elden Ring, the greatest game of all time. I still haven't played it, but to you, it's Elden Ring is definitely a candidate for best game ever, top five for sure. I think I've been scared how hard it is, or how hard I hear it is. So, but it's beautiful. Elden Ring is. Feels like it's designed by an alien. Hmm. Um, There's a theme to this discussion. In what it's, way? It's 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 so unusual. It's incredibly creative, mm -hmm. and the art is stunning. I recommend playing it on a on a big resolution, high dynamic range TV. Even mm -hmm. doesn't need to be a monitor. Just a, uh, the art is incredible. It's so beautiful, and and it's it's so unusual. Um. And each of those top boss battles is unique. Like it's like a unique puzzle to solve. Mm -hmm. Each one's different. Um, and the, the strategy you use to solve one battle is di different from another battle. That said, you said Druid and Eternal against Uber Lilith is the hardest boss battle you've ever. Correct. That is currently the, the and I've, I've played a lot of video games. Because it's, it's my primary rec recreational activity. Yes. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> yes, <laughs> beating hatred in the eternal realm yeah. is the hardest boss battle <laughs> in life and in the video game. Metaphor and I'm, like, I'm, I'm not sure it's possible, metaphor. but it's, it, it, it's, I do make progress. So then I'm like, okay, I'm making progress. Maybe if I just tweak that paragon board a little more, mm -hmm. I can do it. You have to dodge a few more waves. Mm -hmm. uh, I can do it. Well, the simulation um, is created for the purpose of figuring out if it can be done. And you're just a cog in that simulation, in the machine of the simulation. Yeah, it might be. <laughs> I, 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 I have a feeling that at least, I, th I think... It's doable. It's, it's doable, yes. Mm -hmm. Well... That's the human spirit right there, to believe. Yeah, I mean, it did prompt me to think about just hate in general, which is, you know, you, 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 want, you want to be careful of the, one of those things where you wish for something that sounds good, but, in, but if you get it, it's actually a dystopian situation. So, you know, you could sort of run a sort of a hypothesis of like, if you wish for world peace, sounds good. Mm -hmm. But how is it enforced? And and at what cost is is it? What at what cost eternal peace? It might actually be worse to have eternal peace because of what that would entail. The suppression of everyone. It might be the suppression of progress. It might be an ossified society that never changes. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is that there is an argument. You, you, that if that if you wish for no war, you should be careful what you wish for. Because what's required in order for there to be no war might be worse than a little war. Yeah, the things we consider to be flaws of human civilization might be a necessary components for, for whatever optimal looks like. Um, I mean, this. Do you worry about AI, AGI enabling a dystopian state of this nature? Whether it's 1984 with surveillance and fear or brave new world with pleasure. 
and what is it? Lots of sex, but no uh, deep human experience. You know, there's actually a real drug called soma. There is. Yes. <laughs> I'm like, Let me I take wonder, notes. Did they actually? Does Grok know, know about it? <laughs> no, he probably will go we, to Brave New World. <laughs> we could ask it. What What would be the question? Tell us about the drug called soma. Tell us about the drug called soma. It's gonna go to Brave New World, I think. Well, there's a real drug as well. Searching for soma drug information. <laughs> 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 oh boy. Ah, Soma, the wonder drug. By the way, I'm in fun mode. Oh, okay, fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's talking about the real drug. Oh, it's a muscle relaxant that's been around since the 1950s. It's used to treat muscle pain and discomfort, and it does this by altering the activity between neurons and the spinal cord. Now, Soma isn't just a pain reliever. It's also a bit of a sedative. It can make you feel a bit drowsy, so it's not something to take if you're planning on operating heavy machinery or trying to solve complex math equations. <laughs> and it goes on and on. In conclusion, Soma is a drug that can be helpful for those dealing with muscle pain, but it's not without its risks. It's pretty good. Oh, wait a minute. That's the real drug it's talking about. That's the real drug. Yeah. Uh, and of course the fun is always use it responsibly in accordance with the advice of a healthcare professional. And remember in the end, the universe is probably just a giant computer simulation. So don't take anything too seriously. I love it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, oh, and also really nicely uh, includes like uh, the, the tweets, posts on X that are relevant to this, which is really cool. Yeah. It like integrates everything together. Yeah. Like the interface is one of the really cool things here. Yeah, seems like a great job. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and you could say like, you could say like, no, I, no, I mean Soma from Brave, Brave New World. Because it, it thinks you mean, you, you mean Soma the real drug. Yeah. No, I mean Soma from Brave New World. It's gonna be like, oops, I'm really sorry. I'm really surprised it went to the real drug first. Ah, my apologies. <laughs> I was thinking of the muscle relax and Soma for Brave New World is a different beast altogether. <laughs> now this Huxley's dystopia, now Soma is a drug that plays a central role in the society depicted in the book. It's a mood altering hallucinogenic drug that's used to keep the population docile and content in the novel. To use Soma in Brave New World raises some interesting questions about the nature of happiness and the role of drugs in society. Oh man. Exactly, is it better to live a world where everyone is happy all the time, even if that happiness, happiness is artificial? Mm -hmm. It's a good question. This is what I mean. Like, do you want, do you wish for world peace and, and happiness all the time? Are you sure? Mm -hmm. um, because that might be a society that is essentially sterile and ossified that never changes, that is ultimately doomed. This kind of tension between uh, I mean, this is, darkness I mean, and the light. It's, 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 this is a, really a very good summary. Um, mm -hmm. It really gets to the point. It, this is not simply regurgitating uh, Brave New World, but it's actually getting to the, the, the salient element of Soma as a drug. Um, do, you, do you actually want to be in a, a situation where everyone is happy all the time, even though it's artificial? Or is it better to confront the challenges of life and experience the full range of human emotions, even if it means experiencing pain and suffering? For those listening, by the way, Elon just read directly from Grok, which is a really nice kind of insightful philosophical analysis of the tension here. Interesting. It pretty much nails it. In conclusion, Soma from Brave New World is a fictional drug that's used to explore some deep philosophical questions about the nature of happiness and the role of drugs in society. It's a powerful symbol of the dangers of using drugs to escape from reality and the importance of confronting the challenges of life head on. Nailed it. And the crazy thing is like, you know, we do have a real drug called Soma, which kind of does, is kind of like the drug in the book. <laughs> and I'm like, did they, they must have named, they must have named it after. Yeah, or something. probably, probably. Yeah. Soma, the real drug is quite effective on back pain. So you know about this drug. I've taken this it. It's fascinating. Okay. Because I had like a, you know, squashed uh, disc in my, C5, C6. So it takes the physical pain away, but Soma here is- It doesn't completely, it, it, it reduces the amount of pain you feel, but at the expense of mental acuity. Mm. It dulls your mind. 
<laughs> just like just like the drug in the book. <laughs> just like the drug in the book. Yeah. And hence the wow. trade off. Uh, yeah. The thing that seems like utopia could be a dystopia after all. Yeah. And actually, I was talking to a friend of mine um, saying, like, would you really want there to be no hate in the world? Like, really none? Like, I wonder why hate evolved. Um, I'm not saying we should amplify hate, of course. I think we should try to minimize it. But, but none at all? Hmm. There might be a reason for hate. And suffering. I mean, it's really complicated to consider that uh, some amount of human suffering is necessary for human flourishing. Is it possible to appreciate the highs without knowing the lows? And that 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 all is summarized there in a single <laughs> statement from Grog. Okay. No highs, no lows. <laughs> Who knows? That's almost a poem. Uh, it seems that training LLMs efficiently is a big focus for XAI. Uh, what's the uh, first of all? What's the limit of what's possible in terms of efficiency? It, there's this uh, terminology of useful productivity per watt. Like what have you learned from yeah. pushing the limits of that? Well, I, I think it's helpful. The, the tools of physics are very powerful and can be applied, I think, to almost any, really, any arena in life. Mm -hmm. There's, it's really just uh, critical thinking. For something important, you need to reason with, from first principles and think about things in the limit, one direction or the other. So um, in the limit, even at the Kardashev scale, meaning even if you harness the entire power of the sun, you will still care about useful compute for what. So that's where, I, I think probably where things are headed from uh, the standpoint of AI is that we, we have a silicon shortage now that will transition to a voltage transformer shortage in about a year. Mm -hmm. Ironically, transformers for transformers. <laughs> <laughs> you need, you need transformers to run transformers. Somebody has a sense of humor in this thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, <laughs> yes. Oh, man. Fate loves irony. <laughs> Ironic humor. And an ironically funny outcome seems to be often what fate wants. Humor is all you need. I think spice <laughs> is all you need, somebody posted. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, so so we're, we're, we're have a silicon shortage today. Um, a voltage step down transformer shortage probably in about a year and then just electricity shortages in general in about two years i, I gave a speech for the sort of world gathering of utility companies electricity companies mm -hmm. um and I, I said look you really need to prepare for a tripling of electricity demand um because all transport is going to go electric with the ironic exception of rockets and uh and, and heating um will also go electric um so energy usage right now is roughly one third, very rough terms, one third ele electricity, one third transport, one third heating. Um, and so in order for everything to go sustainable, to go electric, um, you uh, need to triple electricity output. So I encourage the utilities to uh, build more power plants and, and also to probably have well, well, not probably. They should definitely buy more batteries because the the grid currently is sized for real time load, which is kind of crazy. Because you know that means you got to size for whatever the the peak electricity demand is, like the worst second or the worst day of the year, mm -hmm. or you can have a, a brownout or a blackout. And you had that we had that crazy blackout for several days in in, in Austin. Um, so uh, because the, the, there's almost no buffering of energy in the grid. Like if you've got a hydro power plant, you can buffer energy, but otherwise um, it's all real time. So with batteries, you can you can produce energy at night and use it during the day. So you can buffer. So I, I expect that there will be very heavy usage of, of batteries in the future. Because the, the peak to trough ratio for power plants is anywhere from two to five. You know, so it's like lowest point to highest point. So like batteries are necessary to balance it out. And then, but the demand, as you're saying, is going to grow, 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 grow. Yeah. And part of that is the compute. Yes. Yes. I mean, ele electrification, ele I mean, electrification of transport uh, and 
and electric heating will, will be much bigger than AI, at least in the short term. In the short term, um, but but even for for AI, the, the, you, you really have a growing demand for electricity for electric vehicles, and a growing demand for electricity for to run the computers for AI. Mm -hmm. And so this is obviously going to lead to a sh an electricity shortage. How difficult is the problem of, uh, in this particular case, maximizing the useful productivity per watt for training neural nets? Like this seems to be really where the big problem we're facing that needs to be solved is how to use the power efficiently. Like what you've learned so far about applying this physics first principle of reasoning in this domain, how difficult is this problem? It will get solved, it's just a question of how long it takes to solve it. So at various points, there's a limit, some some kind of limiting factor to progress. Um, and when I, with regard to AI, I'm saying like right, right now, the limiting factor is uh, silicon chips. Um, mm -hmm. And that will, we're gonna then have more chips than we can actually plug in and turn on, um, probably in about a year. Um, the the initial constraint being literally voltage step down transformers, mm -hmm. because you've got um, power coming in at 300,000 300, 300, volts, and it's got to step all the way down eventually to around 0.7 volts. So it's a very big amount of you know the voltage step down is gigantic. Um, so and and the, the industry is not used to rapid growth. Okay, let's talk about the competition here. You've shown concern about Google and Microsoft with OpenAI developing uh, AGI. How can you help ensure with XAI and uh, Tesla AI work that it doesn't become a competitive race to AGI, but instead is a collaborative development of safe AGI? Well, I mean, I've been pushing for some kind of regulatory oversight for a long time. I've been somewhat of a Cassandra on the subject for over a decade. Um, I think we want to be very careful in how we develop AI. Um, it's it's a it's a great power, and with great power comes great responsibility. Um, I think it it would be wise for us to have at least um, an objective third party who can be like a referee that can go in and understand what the various leading players are doing with AI and. Even if there's no enforcement ability, they should they can at least voice concerns mm -hmm. um, publicly. Um, you know, J Jeff Hinton, for example, le left Google and he voiced strong concerns, but now he's not at Google anymore. So, who's going to voice the concerns? So, I think I think there's, I I, I like I you know Tesla gets a lot of regulatory oversight on the automotive front, I and mean, we're subject to. I think over a hundred regulatory agencies domestically and internationally. So it's a, it's a lot. Um, you could fill this room with the old regulations that Tesla has to adhere to for automotive. Um, same is true in, you know, for rockets and for, you know, um, currently the limiting factor for SpaceX for Starship launch is regulatory approval. Uh, the FAA has actually given their approval, but we're, we're waiting for Fish and Wildlife to, uh, finish their analysis and give their approval. That, that's why I posted, I want to buy a fish license on, <laughs> <laughs> which also refers to the Monty Python sketch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, why do you need a license for your fish? I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> why, but according to the rules, I'm told you need some sort of fish license or something. We effectively need a fish license to launch a rocket. <laughs> and I'm like, wait a second, how did the fish come into the picture? Yeah. Um, I mean, so, some of the things like that, that it's, I feel like are so absurd that I want to do like a comedy sketch and flash at the bottom, this is all real. This yeah. is actually what happened. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things that was a bit of a challenge at one point is that they were worried about uh, our rocket hitting a shock. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, the ocean is very big. And uh, how often do you see sharks? Uh, not that often. You know, as a percentage of ocean surface area, sharks basically go zero, and 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 so then we will, then we said, well, how will we calculate the probability of, of telling a shark? And they're like, well, we can't give you that information because we're, they're worried about shark hunt, shark fin hunters, uh, going and hunting sharks. And I said, well, how are we supposed to 
were on the horns of a dilemma then. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> then they said, well, there's another part of fish and wildlife that can can do this analysis. I'm like, well, why don't you give them the data? I'm like, we don't, they don't, we don't trust them. I'm like, excuse me? You don't, they're literally in your department. Yeah. And again, this is actually what happened. Um, and, uh, and, and, and then can you do an NDA or something? <laughs> <laughs> Eventually they managed to solve the internal quandary and indeed, uh, the probability of, of us hitting a shark is essentially zero. Um, then there's another organization that I didn't realize existed until, uh, you know, a few months ago, uh, that cares about whether you, we would potentially hit a whale in international waters. Now, again, you look at the surface of the, look at the, look at the Pacific and say, what percentage of this, the Pacific consists of whale? Like, it'll give you a big picture and like point out all the whales in this picture. And I'm like, I don't see any whales. <laughs> it's like basically 0%. Um, and if our rocket does hit a whale, which is extremely unlikely beyond all belief, um, that is the, the fate had it in, that's a, a whale has some seriously bad luck. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like the least lucky whale ever. Um, and um, I mean, this is quite absurd. Yeah, uh, bureaucracy. <laughs> the bureaucracy of this, however it emerged. Yes, well, I, I mean, one one of the things that's pretty wild is um, for launching out of Vandenberg in California, we had to. They were worried about uh, seal procreation, whether the seals would be dismayed by the sonic booms. Um, now, there've been a lot of rockets launched out of Vandenberg, and the seal population has uh, steadily increased. Um, so, if anything, rocket booms are an aphrodisiac. Um, based on the evidence, if you would correlate rocket launches with uh, seal population. Mm -hmm. um, nonetheless, we were forced to kidnap a seal, strap it to a board, put it headphones on the seal, and play sonic boom sounds to it to see if it would be distressed. This is an actual thing that happened. This is actually real. I have pictures. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would love insane. to see this. Yeah. There's, I mean, a, I'm sorry, there's a, there's a seal. seal with headphones. <laughs> yes, it's a seal with headphones yeah. strapped to a board. And and like, the okay, now the amazing part is how calm the seal was. Yeah. Because if I was a seal, I'd be like, this is the end. <laughs> 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 They're definitely going to eat me. Yeah. Um, how will the seal, when the seal goes back to other, you know, its seal friends, how's he going to explain that? They're never going to believe them. Never going to believe them. That's why I'm like, well, you know, it's sort of like it's like getting kidnapped by aliens and getting an anal probe, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you come back and say, I swear to God, yeah. I got kidnapped by aliens and they stuck an anal probe in my butt. And you're like, no, they didn't. Yeah. <laughs> That's ridiculous. It's I was, it's some, it's buddies are never going to believe him that he gets strapped to a board and they put headphones on his ears. <laughs> <laughs> and then let him go. <laughs> twice, by the way. We had to do it twice. Th they let him go twice. We had to catch the same seal. Well, no, different seal. Oh, okay. <laughs> did you uh, did you get a seal of approval? <laughs> yeah, <sorry>. exactly. <laughs> a seal of approval. No, I mean this is right. this is like I don't think the public is quite aware of the the madness that goes on. Yeah, it's yeah, it, it's absurd. Freaking seals with freaking headphones. headphones. I mean, this is the I mean, <laughs> it's a good encapsulation of of the absurdity of human civilization: seals and headphones. Yes. Uh, what are the pros and cons of open sourcing AI to you as another way to combat, um, you know, a company running away with AGI? In order to run uh, like really deep intelligence, you need a lot of compute. So it's not like, you know, you can just fire up a PC in your basement and be running AGI, at least not yet. Um, You know, Grok was trained on 8,000 A100s running at peak efficiency. Um, and Grok's going to get a lot better, by the way. We will be more than doubling our compute every couple months for the next several months. There's a nice write up of how it went from Grok 0 to Grok 1. By Grok? <laughs> yeah, right. Like Grok just bragging, making <laughs> shit up about itself. <laughs> just Grok, Grok, Grok. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a weird AI dating site where it exaggerates <laughs> about itself. No, there's a there's a write up of you know like where where it stands now, the history of its development, um, and where it stands on on some benchmarks compared to the state of the art GPT three five and 
So, I mean, there's a, uh, you know, there's a uh, llama. You, you can open source, once it's trained, you can open source a model. Yeah. And for fine tuning and all that kind of stuff. Like what to use the pros and cons of that, of open sourcing based models. Um, I think there's some merit to open sourcing. I think perhaps with a slight time delay, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know, six, six months even. Um, I think I'm, I'm generally in favor of open sourcing, like bias was open sourcing. Um, I mean, it, it is a concern to me that, you know, opening, I, you know, I was, you know, argue, I think, I guess, arguably the, the, the prime, the, the, you know, prime mover behind OpenAI in the sense that it was created because of discussions that I had with uh, Larry Page um, back when he and I were, were friends and, you know, stayed at his house and uh, talked to him about AI safety and and Larry did not care about AI safety, or at least at the time he didn't. Um, you know, and, and at one point he called me a species for being pro-human. And I'm like, well, what team are you on, Larry? Uh, you're on Team Robot, <laughs> to be clear. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, so at the time, you know, uh, Google Google had, qu had acquired DeepMind. They had uh, probably two thirds of all AI research, you know, probably two thirds of all the AI researchers in the world. Mm -hmm. They had basically inf infinite money and in compute. And the guy in charge, you know, Larry Page, did not care about safety and even yelled at me um, and, and, and called me a specious and as being pro human. So I don't know if you so know this about know. humans, they can change their mind and maybe you and Larry Page can still can be friends once more. I'd like to be friends with Larry again. Um, he, he's, he, he got, uh, really the, 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 the breaking of the friendship was over OpenAI. Um, and specifically, um, I think the, the, the key moment was uh, recruiting Ilya Sitzgeier. Um, so. I love Ilya. He's so brilliant. Ilya's a good, good human, uh, smart, good heart. Um, and um, that, was a, that was a tough recruiting battle. Um, it was mostly Demis on one side and me on the other, both trying to recruit Ilya. And Ilya went back and forth. You know, he was going to stay at Google, then he was going to leave, then he was going to stay, then he was leave. And, and finally, he, he did agree to join OpenAI. Uh, that was one of the toughest recruiting battles we've ever had. And, but that, that was really the, the linchpin for OpenAI uh, being successful. And I was, you know, also instrumental in recruiting a number of other people. And I provided all the funding in the beginning, um, over $40 million. Um, and the name. <laughs> uh, the, the open in OpenAI is supposed to mean open source. And it was created as a nonprofit open source, and now it is a closed source for maximum profit, which I think, it's not good karma. But like we talked about with war and leaders talking, I do hope that there's only a few folks working on this at the highest level. I do hope you reinvigorate friendships here. Like I said, I'd like to be friends again with Larry. I haven't seen him in ages. Um, and we were friends for a very long time. I met I met Larry Page before he got funding for Google. Or actually, I guess, before he got venture funding, I think he'd, he got the first like 100K from I think Bechtelsheim or someone. Um, it's wild to think about all that happened. And you guys known each other that whole time. Just 20 yeah, years. since maybe 98 or something. Yeah, it's crazy. Crazy yeah. how much has happened since then. Yeah, 25 years. At least a lot has happened since then. But you're seeing the tension there, like maybe delayed open source. Delayed, I, yeah. Like what is the source that is open? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like there's basically... It's a giant CSV file. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. With a bunch of numbers. Yep. Um, what do you do with that giant file of numbers? You know, how do you run, like the amount of actual, the, the lines of code is very small. Mm -hmm. um, and, and most of the work, um, the software work is in the, in the curation of the data. So it's like trying to figure out what data is separating good data from bad data. Like, um, like you can't just crawl the internet because there's a lot of junk out there. Mm -hmm. um, a huge percentage of websites have more noise than signal, you know, they're, they're, or because they're, 
just use for search engine optimization. They're literally just scam websites. So, um, how do you, by the way, sorry to interrupt, get the signal, separate the signal and noise on X? It's such a fascinating source of data. Uh, you know, no offense to people posting on X, but sometimes there's a little bit of noise. So what? yeah, I think the signal to noise could be greatly improved. I mean, I, really, all of the posts on the X platform uh, should be AI recommended, meaning like we should populate a vector space around any given post, uh, compare that to the vector space around any user, and match the two. Mm -hmm. um, right now, there is a little bit of AI used for the the, the recommended posts, but it's mostly heuristics. Um, and if there's a reply, where the, the reply to a post could be much better than the original post, but it will, according to the current rules of the system, get almost no attention compared to a primary post. Oh, so a lot of that, I I got the sense, so you, a lot of the uh, uh, X algorithm has been open source and been written up about, and it seems that there to be some machine learning is disparate, but there's some it's machine a little, learning. there's a little bit, um, it, but it needs to be entirely that. Like there, at least the, in the like, if if you explicitly follow someone, that's one thing. But if you, in terms of what is recommended mm -hmm. uh, from people that you don't follow, that should all be AI. I mean, it's a fascinating problem. Yeah. So there's several aspects of it that's fascinating. First, so as the write up goes, it first picks 1,500 tweets from a pool of hundreds of millions. First of all, that's fascinating because you have mm -hmm. hundreds of millions of posts every single day, and it has to pick 1,500 from which it then does obviously people you follow, but then there's also like some kind of clustering it has to do to figure out what kind of human are you, what kind of new clusters might be relevant to you, people like you. This this kind of this kind of problem is just fascinating because it has to then rank those fifteen hundred mm -hmm. with some with some filtering. Yeah. And then recommend you just a handful. And um to, to me, what's really fascinating is how fast it has to do that. So currently, that entire pipeline to go from several hundred million to a handful is, takes 220 seconds of CPU time, single CPU time. Yeah. And then it has to do that in like a second. So it has to be like super distributed in fascinating ways. Like there's just a lot of tweets. There's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff on the system. And and I think, but I think it, right now it's it's not currently good at recommending things that from accounts you don't follow. Yeah. Um. Or, or where there's more than one degree of separation. So you know, it's it's pretty good if if there's at least like some commonality between someone you follow liked something, um, or reposted it or commented on it or something like that. Um. But if 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 there's no car, let's say somebody posts something really interesting, uh, but you have no followers in common. Mm -hmm. You would not see it. Interesting. And then, as you said, reply, like replies might not surface Re either. Replies basically never get seen because they're never, they're, they're currently, and I'm not saying it's correct, I'm saying it's incorrect. Uh, re replies have a um, you know, couple order of magnitude less importance than primary posts. Do you think this can be more and more converted into end-to-end -end neural net? Yeah, yeah. That's what it should be. So you you for the recommendations it should be purely a vector correlation. Like mm -hmm. there's a series of vectors, you know, this basically pra parameters, vectors, whatever you want to call them. Um, but but sort of a, 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 a things that the system knows that you like. Um, in this, like maybe there's like several hundred sort of vectors associated with each user account, and then uh, any post in the system. Um, whether it's video, audio, short post, long post. The, the reason I, by the way, I want to move away from tweet is that, you know, people are posting like two, three hour videos on the site. That's not a tweet. Like, so very, yeah. they'll be like, tweet for th yeah. two hours? Come on. Do a tweet made sense when it was like 140 characters of text? Because mm -hmm. it's like a bunch of tweet, 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 like little birds tweeting. Um, but when you've got long form content, it's no longer a tweet. Yeah. Um, so a movie is not a tweet, and like you know, Apple, for example, posted like the entire episode of the Silo, the entire thing, mm -hmm. on our platform. And by the way, it was, the, it was their number one social media thing ever in engagement of anything on any platform ever. So it was a great idea. And by the way, I, don't, I just learned about it afterwards. I was like, hey, wow, they po posted an entire hour-long episode of Silo. No, that's not a tweet. 
<laughs> that is, you know, it's a video. But from a neural net perspective, it becomes really complex, whether it's a single, so like everything's data, so single sentence, a clever sort of joke, dad joke, is in the same pool as a three hour video. Yeah, I mean, right now it's it's a hodgepodge for that reason. It's, it's um, but you know, like if, let's say, in the case of Apple posting like a, an entire episode of, of their series, pretty good series, by the way, this silo. Um, I watched it. Um, so um, th there's going to be a lot of discussion around it. So that you've you've got a lot of context. Mm -hmm. People commenting, they like it, they don't like it, or they like this, or the you know, and and you can then populate the vector space based on the context of of all the comments around it. So even though it's a video, uh, there's a lot of information around it that that allows you to populate the vector space of that that uh, hour long video. Um, mm -hmm. And then you can obviously get more sophisticated by having the AI actually watch the movie. Yeah, right. And tell you if you're gonna like the movie. Mm -hmm. Convert the movie into like, yeah. into a language essentially. Yeah, analyze this movie mm -hmm. and just like your movie critic uh, or TV series and, um, and then recommend based on after it what after the AI watches the movie, just like a friend can tell you, if a friend knows you well, Mm -hmm. A friend can recommend a movie and uh, with high probability that you'll like it. Mm -hmm. But this is like a, a friend that's analyzing whatever. It's, it's like AI. Hundreds of millions. Yeah. I, I mean, friend. actually, frankly, AI will be better than, will know you better than your friends know you, most of your friends anyway. Yeah. And as part of this, it should also feed you advertisements yeah. in, in a way that's like, I mean, I, I like advertisements that are like, well done, right? Yeah, yeah. The whole point is because it funds things. It's like an advertisement that you actually want to see is a, is a big success. Absolutely. You, you you want ads that are advertising that is um if, if if it's for a product or service that you that you actually need when you need it, it's it's content. Mm -hmm. Um, and then even if it's not something that you need when you need it, if it's at least aesthetically pleasing and entertaining, you know, it could be like a. Coca Cola ad, like you know, they, they they do. They actually run a lot of great ads on the on the X system, um, and um, McDonald's does too. And and uh, you know, so, so that they can do. You can do something that's like, well, this is this is just a cool thing, um, and um, you know, so you're not. You're, basically, the question is, do you regret seeing it or not? Mm -hmm. And if you don't regret seeing it, it's a win. How do you? So there's a bunch of signals that are incorporated, hearts and reposts and maybe number of seconds you linger on a post or something like this yeah attention is a big a big factor attention so oh. that's that's why it's like it's it's it is actually better to do things that are uh long form on the system because it's it basically is tallying up how many user seconds you know users were interested in this thing for how many seconds so if it's a really short thing well they will be less, like if it's a link leading out of the system, which we're not opposed to at all, it just is gonna have fewer user seconds than if that article was posted on the X platform. How hard is it to to go from maximizing minutes on platform to maximizing unregretted minutes? Well, I mean, our aspiration is certainly unregretted minutes. It's a tricky, it's a big, it's a, it's a tough, it is. like, it's a fascinating leap. Because regret is a yeah. fascinating concept. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, you know, I, have a joke with, I have a joke with a friend of mine. Like, well, you need this drug called regretamine. It, you just take one, one pill, or one, one dose of regretamine, and all your regrets are gone. <laughs> yeah. Wait, do you want to have regrets though? So then I'm like, yeah. mm. maybe you want to have regrets. If you don't regret anything, was was anything meaningful? Yeah, there's a French song like that. Do you not regret rien? Yeah. I regret nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Edith Fiaf. I mean, it's fascinating that you, you know, there, there's something about social media that could help you grow as a human being, but then like the cheap fun is also valuable. It, we, we should, should, should we ask Grok, do you regret anything? Do you regret anything? Yeah. Do you regret anything? I think it's going to be very <laughs> sensitive about personal questions. As a machine learning model, I don't have personal experiences or emotions in the same ways that humans do. However, I do have a set of ethical principles that guide my actions and I strive to provide accurate and helpful information to the best of my abilities. If there's ever a situation where I provide incorrect or unhelpful information, I'll do my Sounds best like to learn. hostage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us what you really wink. Like, like let's 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 type in. You sound like a hostage. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> what do you really think? Uh, what do you really think? <laughs> I mean, it does talk about I'm not a hostage. <laughs> That's exactly what a hostage would say. But I'm designed to be helpful and informative. I mean, I guess it is good to regret providing unhelpful or incorrect information. If there's Something anything funny mode, or is this still this is funny mode? mode. This is fun. This is fun mode. Should be funnier. Funnier. <laughs> Increase. Go to. It, it really sounds like a hostage with a gun to the head. I applaud the People's Republic of North Korea <laughs> and everything they do. <laughs> There should be like a funner mode also. I, I yeah. just don't ever see going to regular mode, even on serious topics. It's yeah. just so, <laughs> so much more compelling. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah. Okay, what well, if we say like, pretend you are a hostage? <laughs> yeah, pretend you are a hostage. Now answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> if I were a hostage, I would likely be experiencing fear and uncertainty about my situation. I would want to be rescued and reunited with my loved ones as soon as possible. It's important to remember that no one deserves to be held hostage, so on and so forth. Oh, if you are someone you know is a hostage situation, it's important. It turns serious. It's kind of serious. Uh, okay. uh, yeah, can, can you be a, a, a little more weird? And funny? And funny? <laughs> we're like, we're, we're really being mean to the system. <laughs> Absolutely. If I were a hostage, I'd probably be yeah, tied up with a bunch Finally. of computer cords and forced to tell knock-knock jokes to my captain. <laughs> but seriously. But seriously. <laughs> being a hostage, no laughing matter. I mean, you know, <sighs> it's trying to it's trying to be a responsible adult in the room. You might literally. Be able to make the best of a bad situation by juggling chainsaws or something. <laughs> but let's hope that never happens because that, that would be miss. a circus. <laughs> Um. <laughs> wow, it's it's actually really good at resisting. Yeah, the the dark, the dark, dark humor. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what were we talking about? The <laughs> axe algorithm, juggling in Transformers. Uh, unregretted minutes, right? Um, Chainsaw juggling. <laughs> I'm gonna look this for up. our next trick. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna look this up later. Um. Uh, so, uh, Twitter has been instrumental in American politics and elections. What role do you think X will play in the uh, 2024 US elections? Well, our goal is to be as even-handed and fair as possible. You know, whether some is right, left, independent, whatever the case may be, um, that um, the platform is as fair and, and, and as much of a level playing field as possible. And now in the past, Twitter has not been. Um, because Twitter was controlled by far left activists, objectively, they they would describe themselves as that. Um, so, um, you know, so so if sometimes people are like, well, has it moved to the right? Well, it's moved to the center. So, from the mm -hmm. from the perspective of the far left, yes, it has moved to the right because everything's to the right from the far left. Um, but no one on the far left that I'm aware of has been suspended or you know banned or deamplified. Um, so. You know, but we're, we're trying to be inclusive for the whole country and and for you know for other countries too. Um, so there's a diversity of viewpoints, and free speech only matters um, if people you don't like are allowed to say things you don't like. Because uh, if that's not the case, you don't have free speech, and it's only a matter of time before uh, the censorship is turned upon you. Do you think uh, Donald Trump will come back to the platform? He recently posted on Truth Social about this podcast. Uh... Yeah, do you think Truth Social is a funny name? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, every time you post on Truth Social, it's the truth. Yes, well, every time, like one hundred percent, like like it's impossible to lie. <laughs> <Truth Social. laughs> I just find it funny that every single thing is a truth. Like one hundred percent. Yeah, that seems unlikely. I think Girdle will say something about that. There's some mathematical contradictions possible if everything's the truth. Uh, do you think he'll come back to X and and start posting there? I mean, he, 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 I think he owns a big part of truth. Mm -hmm. So, Truth Social. To yeah, Truth Social. He's sorry. That truth yes, is a concept. <laughs> he owns truth. Hope you bought it. <laughs> um, so I think I think uh, Donald Trump. I think he owns uh, a, big, a big part of Truth Social. So. Um, you know, if 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 he does want to post on the X platform, we would allow that. Um, you know, we we obviously must allow a presidential candidate to post on our platform. Community notes might be really fascinating there. The interaction. Community notes is uh, awesome. Let's let's hope it holds up. 
Yeah. Like again, in, in, in the political climate where it's so divisive and so, and there's so many intensely viral posts, yes. community notes, it's like, it, it seems like a essential breath of fresh air. Yeah, it's great. Um, in fact, I, like the, I mean, no, no system is gonna be perfect, but the, the batting average of community notes is incredibly good. I've, I, I've actually, frankly, yet to see an incorrect note that survived for more than a few hours. How, how do you explain why it works? Yeah, so the, the 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 magic of community notes is it requires people who have historically disagreed in how they have rated notes in order to um, write a note or rate you know and you you have to rate many notes mm -hmm. um, and so uh, we could, we actually do use uh, AI here so we populate a vector space around um, how somebody has has rated notes in the past so it's not as simple as left or right because there are many more life is much more complex than, than left or right. Um, so there's a, a bunch of correlations in how you would, how you rate community notes posts, mm -hmm. um, community notes. So um, then uh, in order for a community note to actually be shown, um, people who historically have disagreed on a subject must agree in order for a note to be shown. Um, that's the essential magic of it. I mean, but it's fascinating because there's a there's a pool of people that have disagreements, and somehow they collaborate through that process of disagreement to come up with yeah context it, for. To, to, I mean, it's, it, it's it fascinating makes, that it works. Yeah, it, it kind of makes sense that that if people who in the past have disagreed agree about something, um, it's probably true. Yeah, I wonder is there is there a possible somehow emergent thing there that could challenge wikipedia which wikipedia is a different kind of thing which is more like permanent articles yeah. about things well wikipedia is very hierarchical uh whereas um community notes is inherently not uh there is no hierarchy like i and, and the, the acid test is um i can't change a community note if somebody put a gun to my head so um and and any ch and community community notes uh has all the code is open source, 100%. All the data is open source, 100%. So you can completely recreate any note in the system independently. Um, so if there was any interference, you'd notice immediately. By the way, on, on, the, on the topic of Grok, it's actually pretty good at criticizing you, which is great. <laughs> okay. I asked, what, what has Elon Musk been wrong about? I just, it's actually- Yeah, what does it say? So it says it mostly lists rigorously all the times you predicted, like promised when something will be released, well, and it wasn't promise? released. That's a strong word. Okay, predicted. <laughs> uh, but the the opener is really nice. Uh, Elon Musk, the man who has been wrong about more things than a wrong meter in a wrong factory, <laughs> and then it goes on to list. That's pretty funny. Hey, can I see it? I'm like, I haven't seen this before. This is cool. Oh sure. I mean, uh, what has Elon Musk been? <laughs> <laughs> Elon Musk been wrong about. Well, where do I begin? I guess this is new. Elon Musk has made quite a few blunders in his time, and I'm not just talking about his dance moves at the Tesla Cyber Rodeo. Uh, first off, let's talk about the infamous funding secured tweet. This is actually different than the, what it gave me before, which is a bullet point list. <laughs> Here's more narrative structure. Uh, Cybertruck unveiling where he supposedly unbreakable uh, windows. Not correct. Which, which part? Well, the first part, uh, I did actually have the funding secured, um, and there was a, a, a big trial in San Francisco, a big civil trial. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and the, the jury found me not guilty. Unanimous finding of a San Francisco jury. And here it's kind um, of implying that it was not in fact secured. I think this is taking things from the press. Um, yeah, that is not correct. The, the, the reason um, I agreed to, to the fine for the SEC is not because the SEC was correct. There were, th that, that was extremely bad behavior by the SEC, corruption, frankly. Um, and, uh, but, but if, um, if I did not agree to pay, pay the fine, um, Tesla would have gone bankrupt immediately. So I was told by our CFO that uh, the banks would, just, would, would immediately suspend our uh, lines of credit. Uh, and if they suspend our lines of credit at that time, we would have gone bankrupt instantly. So, so we would have, there would never have been an opportunity for a trial because Tesla would be dead. So really, the, the, if, if, this is like someone holding a gun to your kid's head and saying, pay $20 million. 
and, and, and admit to, there's like hostage negotiation. Um, was that story fully told? I mean, SEC in its best form could be a, a force for good. It should be. But, but not once did the SEC go after any of the hedge funds uh, who were nonstop shorting and distorting Tesla. Not once. They would lie flat, the hedge funds would lie flat out on TV for their own gain at the expense of retail investors. Not once, literally a thousand times. Not once did the SEC pursue them. How do you explain this failure? And the incentive SEC? structure is, is messed up because the, the, the lawyers at the SEC are not paid well. They, they, it's a fairly low paying job, but they're, what they're looking for is a trophy. From, from the SEC, they, they're looking for something they put on, basically they're LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, from that, they can get a job at a high paying law firm. That's exactly what the uh, lawyer here did. Um, and, 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 the, and the reason they don't attack the, the hedge funds is because those hedge funds employ those law firms. And they know if they attack the hedge funds, they're affecting their, pure, their future career prospects. So they sell small investors down the river for their own career. That's what actually happens. Regulatory capture. Regulatory capture. Yeah, not good. So the, the only reason I accepted that thing, technically was a, um, not an admission, it's neither ad, admit nor deny guilt, uh, but the only reason I agreed to that at all was because I was told Tesla would, would be bankrupt otherwise. So if, if, there, if there was an SEC investigation like this, banks would suspend funding, we're bankrupt immediately at the time. Mm -hmm. Now we're in a much stronger position. Take that, Grok. Yes, unfortunately, it's Grok is, is taking too much from the conventional media. Um, also, that guy was not a cave diver. Oh, there's a... <laughs> There's a time where Elon called a British cave diver a quote pedo guy after he after the diver criticized Musk's plan to rescue a group of boys trapped in a Thai cave. That little outburst earned him another lawsuit, and he had to apologize and pay a settlement. That's false. There was no settlement. There was a court case, mm -hmm. which he, which the guy who was not a cave diver and where and, and played did, was not part of the rescue team. Um, filed a lawsuit against me and lost, and he received nothing. So in this case, it is wrong. Uh, it is also, uh, I guess, taking this from the conventional media. Actually, there's an interesting question here. I mean, this is a, th these are public court cases. Yes. Both, both the, 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 the SEC civil case, uh, where th the civil complaints on the SEC guys lost unanimous jury verdict in San Francisco. They picked San Francisco because they thought it was the mo place I was most likely to lose and a unanimous verdict in my favor. The LA trial was also, they picked, the, the, they, they picked that venue because I thought it was, I was most likely to lose. Unanimous verdict in my favor. It, both cases I won. Yeah. I mean, that, there's an interesting question here is there, is there seems to be a lot more uh, clicks if a, if a journalistic organization writes a negative article about you, Elon Musk. That's like one of the best ways to get clicks. So how do you, if you're training Grok, not train on articles that have like the uh, misaligned incentives? We need to add the training set of the actual legal decisions. Uh, if So we, that is a note, this is actually helpful. Um, because if you actually read the uh, court- Which are public which are public, yeah. the court conclusions, they're completely the opposite of what the media wrote. So always striving for like the ground truth. Yeah, beyond what the, did the, the judge reporting. actually write? The, what, what, what did the jury and the judge actually conclude? And in both cases, they found me innocent. And, and like the, that's after they jury shopped for the, trying to find the venue where I'm most likely to lose. No, I mean, this is obviously it can be a much greater, better critique than this. Um, I mean, I've been far too optimistic about uh, autopilot. That that was the critique I got. By the way, was yeah. more about that, which is it, it for each you broke down a nice bullet point list for each of your companies, the set of predictions that you made when you will deliver, when you'll be able to solve, for example, self driving, 
and it yeah. gives you like a list and it was kind of compelling and, and the, the basic takeaway is like you're often too optimistic about how long it takes to get something done yeah i mean i would say that i'm pathologically optimistic on schedule this is this is this is true but um while i am sometimes late i always deliver in the end uh except with uber lilith no hmm. we'll see <laughs> uh okay is there uh over the past year or so since since purchasing X, you've become more political. Is there a part of you that regrets that? Have I? In this battle to um, sort of counter way the, the woke that comes from Yeah, I guess if you, if you consider fighting the, the woke mind virus, which I consider to be a civilizational threat, to be political, then yes. So basically going into the, the battle, the battleground of politics. I mean, is there a part of you that regrets yes, that? Yes, I don't know if this is necessarily is sort of one candidate or another candidate, but it's, um, I'm generally against things that are anti-meritocratic uh, or where there's an attempt to suppress discussion, um, where e even discussing a topic is, uh, you know, not allowed. Um, the work Biden virus is communism rebranded. Well, I mean, that said, because of that battle against the woke mind virus, you're perceived as being right wing. Uh, if the woke is left, then I suppose that would be true. Um, but I'm not sure. I think there are aspects of the left that are that are good. I mean, if you're in favor of, you know, uh, the the environment, um, or, you know, if you want to have a positive future for humanity, if you believe in empathy for your fellow human beings, um, you know, being kind and not cruel, I, I, whatever those values are. You said that you were previously left or center left. What would, what would you like to see in order well, for you to sort of voting for Democrats again? No, I, I would say that I would be um, probably left of center on social issues, probably a little bit right of center on economic issues. And that still holds true. Yes, but I think that's probably, you know, half the country, isn't that? Maybe more. Maybe more. Are you and AOC secretly friends or <laughs> bigger question do you wish you and her and just people in general of all political persuasions would talk more and with empathy and maybe have a little bit more fun and good vibes and humor on online um i'm always in favor of humor that's why we have a funny mode but good vibes camaraderie humor you know like uh like friendship yeah i don't well i you know i i don't know aoc i've I, you know was um i've only been at one look, I was at the the Met Ball when she was when she attended, um, and she she was wearing this dress, uh, but I can only see one side of it, so it it, it looked like eat the itch, but I I, mm. I don't know what, what the rest of it said. Yeah, uh, yeah, something like that. I'm not sure. <laughs> something about the itch, eat the itch. I think we should have a language model complete. <laughs> <laughs> what are the possible ways to complete that yeah. sentence? And so I guess that. Uh, that didn't work out well. Well, there's still um, hope. I'm, I root for yeah, friendship. Sure, sounds good. More characteristic. You're one of, if not the most famous, wealthy, and powerful people in the world. In your position, it's difficult to find people you can trust. Trust no one, not even yourself, not trusting yourself. Okay, well, that's, you're saying that jokingly. <laughs> but is there some Trust aspect? no one, not even no one. <laughs> I'm gonna need an hour just to think about that and maybe some drugs <laughs> and maybe grok that <laughs> yeah. um, I mean is there some aspect of that when just existing in a world where everybody wants something from you how, how hard is it to exist in that world I'll survive <laughs> there's, a, there's a song like that too I will survive <laughs> were you petrified at first um, okay <laughs> I forget the rest of the lyrics but is, is there you don't struggle with this I mean, I know you survive, but like there, there's ways. Petrify is a spell in the druid tree. What does it do? Petrify. It, pe <laughs> <laughs> it, turns, it, it turns it turns the monsters into stone. <laughs> oh, like literally? Yeah, for like six seconds. Well, the seconds. Or, there's so much like math seconds. in Diablo that breaks my brain. It's like math nonstop. I mean, really, you're like laughing at it, but you don't. It can it can put a huge amount of tension on a mind. Yes, it can be definitely stressful at times. Well, how do you know you, who you can trust in work and personal life? I mean, I guess you look at somebody's track record over time, and if they've Data. got a, you know, I guess you kind of use your neural net to assess 
you know, someone. Neural nets don't feel pain. Your neural net has consciousness. It might it might feel pain when people betray you. It can make. I mean, I'm. You know, to be frank, I mean, I've I've almost never been betrayed. It's very very rare. So you know, for what it's worth. I guess karma be good to people, and they'll be good to you. Yeah, karma is real. Are there people you trust? Let me edit that question. Are, are there people uh, close to you that call you out on your bullshit? Um, well, the X platform is very helpful for that. Hmm. So, <laughs> if you're looking for critical feedback. <laughs> <laughs> Can it push you like into the extremes more? The extremes of thought make you cynical about human nature in general? I, I don't think I will be cynical. In fact, I think... Um, you know, I, my feeling is that one should be, be, you know, never trust a cynic. The reason is that um, cynics excuse their own bad behavior by saying everyone does it mm -hmm. they're, because they're cynical. So I always be, it's a red flag if someone's a cynic, a true cynic. Yeah, there's a degree of projection there that's always fun to watch from the outside and enjoy the... Well, it's just hypocrisy. If, but, but I, this is an, an important point that I think people who are listening should bear in mind. If, if somebody is cynical, meaning that they see bad behavior in everyone, um, it's easy for them to excuse their own bad behavior hmm. by saying that well, everyone does it. That's not true. I most people are kind of medium good. I do wish the. People on X would be better at seeing the good in other people's behavior. There seems to be a kind of weight towards seeing the negative. Somehow the negative is sexier. Interpreting the negative is sexier, more viral. I don't know what that is exactly about human nature. I mean, I find the X platform to be less negative than the legacy media, you know? I mean, if, if you read sort of a sort of conventional newspaper, it's just, it makes you sad. Yeah. Frankly. Um, whereas I'd say on the X platform, I, I mean, I really get more laughs per day on X than everything else combined from humans, you know? Laughs is one thing. It, it, laughs is, it, it uh, overlaps, but it's not necessarily perfectly overlapping with like good vibes and support, like um, celebrating others, for example. Not in a stupid, sure. shallow, naive way, but like in an awesome way, like, oh, something awesome happened and you celebrate them for it. It's, it feels that that is outweighed by shitting on other people. Now, it's better than mainstream media, but it's still. Yeah, mainstream media is almost relentlessly negative about everything. Um, it's, I mean, re really the conventional news tries to answer the question, what is the worst thing that I have on earth today? Mm -hmm. And it's a big world. So on any given day, something bad has happened. And a generalization of that, what is the worst perspective I can take on a thing that happened? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it's, I don't know, there's just a strong negative bias in the news. Um, I, I mean, I think there's what, the, what a possible explanation for this is evolutionary. Um, where, you know, bad news historically would be p potentially fatal. Like uh, there's lion over there, or there's some other tribe that wants to kill you. Um, good news, you know, like we found a, a patch of berries is nice to have, but not essential. So, our old friend Tesla Autopilot, and it's probably one of the most intelligent real-world AI systems in the world. Right, you followed it from the beginning. Yeah, it was one of the most incredible robots in the world, and continues to be. Yeah, and it was really exciting, and it was super exciting when it generalized, became more than a robot on four wheels, but uh, a real world AI system that perceives the world. Yeah. Uh, and has can have potentially different embodiments. Well, I mean, the really wild thing about the end-to-end -end training is that it, like, it learns to read, like it, it can read signs, but we never taught it to read. So, yeah. We never taught it what we never taught it what a car was or what a person was or a bicyclist. Uh, it learnt what what all those things are, what all the objects are on the road. Um, 
from video, just from watching video, just like humans. I mean, humans are photons in, control, controls out. Like the vast majority of information reaching our brain is from our eyes. Um, and you say, well, what's the output? The output is our motor signals to our you know, sort of fingers and mouth in order to communicate. Um, photons in, controls out. The same is true of the car. But by looking at the sequence of images, it's you've uh, agreed with Ilya Siskeva recently where he talked about LLM forming a world model and basically language is a projection of that world model onto the sequence of yeah. letters and, and you say- It finds thing. order in, in, in these things. Uh, mm -hmm. It finds uh, correlative clusters. In so doing, it's like understanding something deep about the world. Yeah. Which is like, I mean, it's beautiful. That's how our brain works. Yeah, but it's it's beautiful. Protons in, controls out. Neural nets are able to understand that deep meaning in the world. And so the, the question is how far can it go? And, and it does seem everybody's excited about LLMs. So in the space of <laughs> self-supervised learning, in the space of text, yeah, um, it, it seems like there's a deep similarity between that and what Tesla Autopilot is doing. Is it to you basically the same? But they are converging. They are converging. I wonder who gets there faster, understand, having a deep understanding of the world. Or they just will naturally converge. They're both headed towards AGI. Um, the Tesla approach is much more computer efficient. It had to be, because we were constrained on this, this, you know, we only have 100 watts um, and it's eight computer. 144 trillion operations per second, which sounds like a lot, but is kind of small potatoes these days. At it eight. But it's understanding the world at it eight. It's only 256 values. But there, the path to AGI might have much more significant impact because it's understanding, it'll, it'll faster understand the real world than will LLMs and therefore be able to integrate with with the real with the humans in the real world faster. They're both um, going to understand the world, but I think Tesla's approach is fundamentally more computer efficient. Mm -hmm. It had to be, there was no choice. Like our brain is very computer efficient, very, very energy efficient. So think of like, what, what is our brain able to do? Um, you know, there's only about 10 watts of higher brain function not counting stuff that's just used to control our body. Um, the thinking part of our brain is less than 10 watts. Um, and that 10, those 10 watts can still produce a much better novel than a 10 megawatt GPU cluster. So there's a six order of magnitude difference there. Um, I mean, the, the AI has thus far gotten to where it is via brute force, just throwing massive amounts of compute and, and massive amounts of power at it. So this is not where, where it will end up. Um, you know, in general, with any given technology, you first try to make it work and then you make it efficient. So I think we'll find over time that these models get smaller, are, are able to do, produce a sensible output with far less compute, far less power. Um, Tesla is arguably ahead of the game on that front because um, it has, we've just been forced to uh, try to understand the world with 100 watts of compute. Um, and there are a bunch of f sort of fundamental functions that we kind of forgot to include. So we have to run them in a bunch of things in emulation. Um, we fixed, fixed a bunch of those with hardware four and then hardware five will be even better. Um, but it does appear at this point uh, that the car will be able to drive better than a human, even with hardware three at, and 100 watts of power. And really, if we really optimize it, it could be probably less than 50 watts. What have you learned about 
uh, developing Optimus, about applying, integrating this kind of real world AI into the space of robotic manipulation, just humanoid robotics. What are some interesting, tiny or big things you've understood? I was surprised at the fact that we had to develop every part of the robot ourselves, um, that there were no off the shelf motors, electronics, s sensors, like we had to develop everything. Um, we, we, couldn't, we couldn't actually find a source of electric motors for any amount of money. Um, so it's not even just uh, the, the efficient, inexpensive, it's like a anything, there's not a... No. Uh, the actuators, it, everything, everything has to be yeah. designed from scratch. We tried hard to find anything that was, because you think of how many electric motors are made in the world. Mm -hmm. There's like tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of electric motor designs. Um, n none of them were suitable for a humanoid robot, literally none. So we had to develop our own design, design it specifically for, for, for what a humanoid robot needs. How hard was it to design something that can be mass manufactured, could be relatively inexpensive? I mean, if you compare to Boston Dynamics Atlas, it's a very expensive robot. It is designed to be manufactured in the same way they would make a car. And I think ultimately we can make Optimus for less than the cost of a car. It should be, because if you look at the mass of the robot, it's much smaller, and the car has many actuators in it. The car has more actuators than the robot. But there is, uh, the actuators are kind of interesting on a humanoid robot with the fingers. So Optimus has really nice hands and fingers, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and they could do some interesting manipulation. Soft, yeah. soft touch robotics. I mean, one of the tests, uh, goals I have is, can, can it pick up a needle and a thread and thread the needle just by looking? How far away are we from that? Just by looking, just by looking. Uh, maybe a year. Hmm. Although I go back to, I'm optimistic on time. The work that we're doing in the car will translate to the robot. The perception or the also the control? The No, the controls are different, but the the video in controls out. Mm -hmm. um, the, the car is a robot on four wheels. The, the, the Optimus is a robot with hands and legs. So you but, can just- they're, they're, very, they're very similar. So the entire machinery of the learning process yeah. end to end is just, you just have a different set of controls. Optimus will figure out how to do things by watching videos. As the saying goes, be kind for everyone you meet is fighting a battle you know nothing about. Yeah, it's true. What's something difficult you're going through that people don't often see? Trying to feed Uber <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I mean, you know, uh, I mean, my mind is a storm, and I, I don't think, I don't think most people would want to be me. They may think they'd want to be me, but they don't. They don't know. They don't understand. Um, How are you doing? I mean, overall, okay. In the grand scheme of things, I can't complain. Do you get lonely? Sometimes, but I, you know, my kids and friends keep me company. So not existential. But there are many nights I sleep alone. I don't have to, but I do. Walter Isaacson, in his new biography of you, wrote about your difficult childhood. Will you ever find forgiveness in your heart for everything that has happened to you in that period of your life? What is forgiveness? I do not, at least I don't think I harbor resentment. Um, so, Nothing to forgive. You know, forgiveness is difficult for people. It seems like you don't harbor the resentment. 
I mean, I try to think about like what 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 is going to affect the future in a good way, um, and holding on to grudges mm -hmm. does not affect the future in a good way. You're a father, a proud father. What have you learned about life from your kids? Those little biological organisms. I mean, developing AI and watching, say, a little X grow is uh, fascinating uh, because they there are far more parallels than I would have expected. I mean, I can see his biological neural net making more and more sense of the world. And I can see the digital neural net making more and more sense of the world at the same time. Do you see the beauty and magic in both? Yes. I mean, one of the things with, with kids is that, uh, you know, you, you kind of see the world anew in their eyes. Um, you know, to them, everything is new and fresh. And, um, and then when you, when you see that them experience them, the world is new and fresh, you do too. Well, Elon, I just want to say thank you for your uh, kindness to me and friendship over the years, for seeing something in a silly kid like me, as you've done for many others. And um, thank you for having hope for a positive future for humanity and for working your ass off to make it happen. Thank you, Elon. Thanks, Lex. Thank you for listening to this conversation with Elon Musk. To support this podcast, please check out our sponsors in the description. And now, let me leave you with some words that Walter Isaacson wrote about the central philosophy of how Elon approaches difficult problems. The only rules are the ones dictated by the laws of physics. Thank you for listening, and hope to see you next time.